homepage, which is over here on the on the right, is intended to be a uh, ever-evolving resource for various affected sectors in Wyoming, along with providing links to many of the maps and uh, the data that go into these webinars. So if you're interested in conditions and just can't wait until the next webinar, click on the maps and data link and you can track the progress of conditions uh, daily. The maps are, are updated each day. Uh, communication is two-way on this, and I can't stress enough the need for information that will be going out to you, but we need feedback coming in from you such as, do you know of uh, new regulations spawned by the drought? Is there a new assistance program that has either been started or has been activated? And everyone can help get the word out. And everyone can help monitor drought, but we'll have, a, we'll have some more on that later at the end of the webinar. Now, as was showcased in the center part of the new, new drought page, this is the current drought monitor. And this is a weekly product uh, spanning through each Tuesday. And it was just released this morning. Uh, the drought map is based on a lot of indicators, such as precipitation, soil moisture, stream flow, several others. And those indicators are value, evaluated in terms of percentiles, not percentages, but percentiles, uh, which differ from percentages in that they're bounded between 0 and 100, with the 50 being the median value. So if you look at the median value, you can expect that half the values will be above that and half will be below that. It's not the average of the values, it's just the one in the middle. And this is similar to how X year events are determined. For example, in a set of data, uh, say at the five percentile ranking, you can expect that for any, you know, for, if you're looking at annual values that in 100 years, only five years will be lower than that value, at or lower than that value. And that then that percentile becomes a one in 20 year event. So here up in the upper right, you can see some of the percentiles that generally define the various levels of drought. One way of looking at these Percentiles is in the terms of probability of occurrence. You could on average expect to see D4 conditions 2% of the time. And using that years analogy, these would be conditions that you would expect on average uh, once in every 50 years. And looking at the map itself, you can see that we had compared to our last webinar, a few areas of improvement where we've had uh, some wetter conditions. Uh, but the bigger story is that we've had some degradations down here in the southwest, up here in the north, and then the northeast is, is really starting to, starting to get dry. So we've seen major degradations in this area up in here. Now let's move on and look at the 14-day precipitation. This is, again, in terms of a percentile, and this is from the 3rd of June through the 16th. And about the only thing really to say about this is it's been dry. There's a few locations over here in the, you know, in the far southeast and along the east here that are at the median or very few that are above median. But by and large, the entire state the last two weeks has, has been well below the 50th percentile and actually down into the, the 10th and lower for a good chunk of the state here. Looking at the same map, but over a 90-day period, it's a little bit better, you know, taking into account some of the earlier precipitation we had that uh, seems to be no longer. But we're still seeing, uh, you know, over here in the east, we got some of the little areas above, uh, above the median. Down here in the southeast, the same area above median. And a lot of Fremont County is right at the median. But again, whole western part here in the northeast, unfortunately, again, and then down here in the in the south central part where we still have some of the uh, D3 from last summer still lingering. It's, it's dry even at 90 days. Now, if we look at the, this is the standardized precipitation index. And what this does is take totals over, you know, precipitation totals over various time intervals and then fits those values into a probability distribution, sort of an occurrence interval and calculates the number of standard deviations that a total is away from that, uh, the mean of that. And so then with that, the values center around zero, which are basically neutral conditions. And then with positive values being wet and uh, negative values being on the dry side of it. And this map shows 30, 60 and 90 day uh, timeframes. And you can see over here in the, in the West where we've had some improvements that we've gone from fairly bad down at the 90 day, improved a little when you're looking at it at 60, and then at the 30 day, it's, it's looking about neutral even on the wet side. Uh, conversely, we've had in the, the Southeast here, we've gone from 
you know, on the wet side to where we're losing ground. And then this whole area here in the middle where we, you know, we started out even at 90 days, we're not looking too good, but it has been expanding uh, over, the, over the period of time that we're looking at. So you know, here's when you look at a 30 day total of how, how bad this, this area of the state is getting to be. And this is looking at, uh, it's a step further, it's standard precipitation evapotranspiration uh, index. And it's basically, it takes the SPI, but goes one step further and looks at atmospheric demand for moisture. Uh, it, in, it includes how thirsty the atmosphere is in terms of uh, demand for water. And this gives you sort of a potential evapor, evapotranspiration. And again, these maps are showing 30, 60, and 90 days. And you can see some of the areas, same areas still sticking out here, a little bit of yellow under the white side coming up neutral, but this area here up here in the north, uh, northeast where we also have the demand, the dryness, uh, it's, it's not looking too good up there and it's, it's very much reflected in this map. Uh, you can kind of see how it evolved when you look at the 90 days, 60 day, and then in the 30 day, how that, that area is expanded when you look at the, the narrower time frame showing how it's, how it's getting bad. Now we'll look at uh, minimum temperature over the last two weeks, uh, nighttime elevations, very few spots still looking at uh, nighttime lows below 32. Uh, you know, out in the plains, we're seeing up into the mid 50s, upper 50s, even lower 60s in some places for average minimum temperatures over that two, two week period. And down here on the lower left, you'll see this is the temperature in terms of a departure from the average conditions. And as you can see, most areas, three to nine degrees above average, a few spotty areas along here where we're looking at the red and darker red are, are 12 degrees above average or more. Uh, the yellow here is still above average, but only by about three degrees. And this one little spot, if you can see it up here where there's a little bit of green was the only part in the state where the, the 14 day average minimum temperature was actually below the normal, uh, probably a, a couple square kilometers. So I wouldn't go looking for it. Looking at the other end of it on the maximum, uh, you see we got low time, low daytime highs in the 50s and 90s for much of the you know, north central, northeastern part of the state. The departure from average is the real telling part of the story here. And you look at the far south here, we're seeing sort of a lighter red that you see up in here in the higher elevation, which is only nine to 12 degrees above the average. But most of the state from this line here northward is, is 12 or more degrees above average with this, this area up in here being over 15 degrees above the average for the last two weeks. And unfortunately, that's where we're starting to see uh, the SPEI, SPI, and everything going down. And as you've seen a little bit, the soil moisture is not looking good there as well. And that brings us to the soil moisture. And this is comparing us from two weeks ago on the 2nd of June, what we were looking at compared to uh, yesterday's final values. And it has gotten worse everywhere except in places where there's no lower category on the map to, to be picked. We've got huge, huge swath here that's down in the that uh, second or less percentile, that one in 50 occurrence. And the little small area down here in the very far Southeast, it's at the 20th to 30th percentile, but that, that's gonna be gone pretty soon. But dry soil is, is the story of this map. And looking at a particular station, this time I'm gonna show you our station, our Mesonet station on the Thunder Basin grassland site, which is, it's on the, the border between uh, Campbell and uh, Converse County. We got a station there measuring soil moisture at various depths. And you can see back about two weeks or so ago, we were in a gradual decline here at the, at the highest, uh, you know, the shallowest depth, but then it really started to, to take off down here around the, uh, around the start of the start of the month, which kind of coincides with when we were seeing those uh, hot and dry in that other map. And at all, all levels, all depths, we're seeing that same decline going down. And, and even at a half a meter or 20 inches, we're starting to see it peaked up here around the 6th or so of June. And it's just starting to gradually come on down and, and, and losing moisture in there. Now, one question I get asked a lot is, you know, how, how is this drought compared to any previous droughts? Or is this the worst drought that we've had? Or how does this compare to 2012? And, 
So here's a good way of looking at it. Now this is taking the state as a whole. So it's not looking at a particular area. It's just looking at the, the percentage of the state as a whole that's in each of the particular drought categories. And you can see how the, the 2020, 2021 peaked out here compared to the 2012 into 2013 one here, and then our 2006, 2007 uh, drought. And as you can see for, you know, we're, we're still below what we were looking at in 2012, but things are not looking good. And uh, we, we came down here after the end of it and had a little bit of a rise where we got a little bit more of the, the extreme drought showing up in the state. And we're starting to see that again, but we're starting out down here as far as area wise. But the telling thing on all this is what are our conditions in 2013 versus right now? And looking at the soil moisture, which is the real telling one, here's what it was eight years ago. Here's what it is today. And so that's why with, uh, I won't steal uh, any of Jared's thunder with the outlooks and forecasts, but knowing what's what the forecasts are coming forward, that's why things are not too optimistic as we start moving uh, you know, deeper into the summer months. So on, the, on that note, uh, I'll turn it over to Aaron Fiaschetti with the USGS to talk about surface water. Thank you, Tony. Um, hold on a second. You caught me off guard here. So uh, let, me, let me fix my screen here real quick. OK, <clears throat> so here we are in mid-June and just wanted to go through our flows at our gauging stations. And uh, just real quick, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about this graphic from Water Watch, which is a really good way to kind of get a handle on what's going on throughout the state. I know a lot of people are kind of focused on a specific gauge or a specific area, but for looking at the state as a whole, this is a good good way to go about it. And uh, just kind of real quickly, the green, the normal, that's any flow on this day or in this seven day period that for the seven day average that's within the 25th and 75th percentile. So that's what we're considering normal for right now. And uh, that's a pretty wide range. So, you know, we got a fair amount of green in there, but not a ton. So white circles, those are not ranked. That might either be that there was some missing data or the period of record of the gauge is less than 30 years. And if you do go to Water Watch and you kind of hover around and you look at a lot of these gauges, a lot of the green is below the median. So maybe it's not as rosy as it appears to be with having normal flows and a fair amount of the state and a fair amount of the gauges. So, but if we could go to the next slide, Anthony. So just comparing to where we were a month ago when Brian presented, the pink circles are kind of highlighting areas where flows have decreased in, you know, up in the, the Lamar and Gardner River coming out of the park. I know that water goes to Montana, but it seems like flows in Yellowstone Park are a pretty good indicator of natural flow in an area that should be wet and have reasonable flow. So those flows have degraded to below normal. And when you're talking about flows that are in that 25th percentile or less, that's uh, significantly below normal. So over in the, to the east of the Bighorns, flows have degraded there a bit in the Tongue and Powder Basin. And then down uh, in the Green and Bear River flows have gotten a bit worse down in that neck of the woods. There was an, one area of improvement in the Wind River or the, in the Green, in the Upper Green and the Snake River in the West Central part of the state. If we could go on to the next slide, please. So just kind of a I wanted to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of where we should be on the hydrograph for the year. 
Um, and we should be about at the peak or past the peak, depending on the elevation of the gauge or proximity to the mountains. Um, so here in 2021, we really haven't seen any significant high flows and I don't expect to see any unless a large rainstorm occurs. And uh, so we've covered that we're past our peak and now we're moving on to the falling limb of the hydrograph and moving into the base flow. So I got two graphics from Water Watch. One is the North Platte, and you can see those flows are below normal, trending towards uh, very low. We're past the peak there. And then the next hydrograph is the Wind River near Du Bois. And uh, we're just past the peak, and flows seem to be pretty close to the median right there. So, um, so just to kind of put a, a, a little context to where, where we should be in flows right now. Next slide, Tony. So just kind of taking a little peek at what we had is for runoff starting in April 1 till today. If you look here at the North Fork of the Shoshone, uh, you see the blue, that's the observed daily flow in 2021 versus the light yellow or orange line. That would be the period of record average. You know, things seem pretty normal draining off of the east side of Yellowstone there. If you go over to the Bighorn at Kane, you see much below average flows till about the end of May, and then flows come up to closer to the average. I know that's pretty far down on the river. That could be a bit of regulation at reservoirs higher up. But in general, if you thought about that volumetrically from April 1 to till now, and I know that there'll be a discussion of volumetric flow later, that you're going to be much behind that uh, uh, volumetric average for that location on the Bighorn. And then just going over to the powder near Arvada, you just see much below average flows for the early spring. And then a, just a short period of near normal or near average flows. I know we're talking about average, median, normal, and it's a lot of terms being thrown out here, but bear with me. Um, so pretty dry over there in the, the powder river. So that's a, just a general synopsis of what's been observed in the north. If we go on to the next slide, we can look at the south and central part of the state. And if you look at uh, Pine Creek above Fremont Lake, you know, things are pretty normal, pretty close to the average. Volumetrically, you'll come out probably pretty near that, uh, what you would expect for an average year. But if you go down to the Green River near Green, they're very much below the average and probably volumetrically you're going to come out behind and, and probably some of that is regulation and management in the, the drainage. And then if you know one of the seems like one of the brighter spots in the state is uh, in the Cheyenne area and that Laramie River at Laramie, Wyoming is very close to the average. So things look pretty good on that river system. The next slide, please, Tony. And just to cover storage here, uh, you know, in general, uh, a significant part of the state did gain some storage over the last month. And I've highlighted that here with this poorly drawn uh, black square of sorts, but um, it gives you a general idea of where we've gained some storage. The rest, stayed the same or lost a little bit of storage. And in general, compared to last year, last year, there's a lot less water in storage if you make a comparison between that map and in 2020 to where we are in 2001. And you know, increases in storage should generally align pretty well with the peak flows on your hydrograph. So over the last month, probably should have seen, been seeing pretty large gains in storage. And in some reservoirs, there was uh, some pretty big gains. So that's all I have 
for right now. So thank you. Thanks. And next up will be Jared Allen with the Cheyenne National Weather Service to talk about forecasts and outlooks. Great. Thanks, Tony. You just want to go ahead right there. Perfect. Uh, so overall, as you can kind of see right there on the left-hand side, we're looking at our seven-day quantitative precipitation forecast. So what that just boils down to is what, what is the liquid amount of water that will be falling down since we're no longer, certainly in the winter time, this is going to be all liquid rain. Very nice that what we really do need, certainly around here, uh, given the recent expansion of the drought conditions. So uh, the, the Bighorn Mountains look to have the, the most overall, that are favored to have the most overall in the next week. We're really just looking at isolated coverage today, tomorrow. Uh, but then as we finally get into Sunday and Monday, we're gonna be having a cold front that kind of sweeps down through the region. And that's primarily where most of the bulk of this green and kind of those blues will be coming from is on that Sunday and early Monday timeframe. Uh, but overall, you're only looking at, you know, a 10th to a quarter in the Northeast High Plains or on the Eastern portion of the state, uh, further to the West into the Wind River Range, a little bit more in the higher terrain uh, but once you get out of the higher terrain and further to the south and southwest, unfortunately, it looks like we're going to be looking at uh, a tenth of an inch or less uh, at best, maybe not even anything there for the southwest part of the state, unfortunately. So while any precipitation is certainly welcome, uh, these amounts will not really put too much of a dent in the current ongoing drought conditions because that soil, as Tony has been highlighting, is just super, super thirsty. But then at the same time, the atmosphere is very thirsty. So we just need to try and get as much moisture as we can. So what does fall, unfortunately, either gets absorbed by the soil uh, a little bit or the atmosphere takes it out pretty quick. Uh, so if you just want to move on to the next slide. There, Tony, we're going to be looking at the extended periods now, so the six to 10 day precipitation there in the upper right. Unfortunately, uh, the south third of the state is going to be looking at favored possibilities for below normal precipitation, uh, but that north two third uh, will be at least at least near normal, mostly at least favored to be near normal. But unfortunately, that does not help the drought situation whatsoever. And then kind of the tail of the tape uh, based off what everyone's been saying. Uh, over there on the left hand bottom side for the temperature outlook. Continued warm pretty much all across the state, especially the southwest part. So sadly, that might further aid in greater evaporative demand uh, and take more moisture, whatever moisture is in the soil, uh, out a little bit more. So decent signal for above normal temperatures favored uh, for the state of Wyoming uh, in the next six to 10 days. So if you go forward one more there, Tony, we'll just kind of move the, the time frame a little bit more. So basically rounding out the end of the month uh, where there is at least some positive news right there for that eight to 14 day period from the 24th through the 30th, at least the northeast part, north central part of the state is favored to be slightly above normal uh, precipitation wise. That'll be nice. Uh, they may be looking at maybe an inch, maybe two up in that location per some long range models that we've been looking at. Uh, but unfortunately, the further south and southwest you go, uh, more favored to be near neutral or slightly below normal. So we'll take any precipitation that we can get, but unfortunately, still going to be running some deficits. And yet again, that 8 to 14 temperature outlook continued uh, on the warm side being favored at least 33, 40, if not 50 percent likelihoods of having above normal temperatures to round out the end of the month. So the, the, with the drought conditions ongoing and the limited soil moisture that's already present, uh, looks like it's still going to be remaining a, a hot, dry end of the month of June. And then to round out with my last slide, if you want to go forward, just there on the left, is just highlighting where severe drought is ongoing across the state right now. And as Tony has mentioned, it's likely that that area is going to be expanding and may connect down there further to the south and southwest as well. There might be a little bit of a reprieve up there in the super far northeast, maybe towards the end of the month, but we'll have to kind of see how that works itself out. But certainly central and south, likely some further expansions. And then there on the right side, uh, we're going to be seeing some more heat building back in as well. So anything that's in that red area and south and southwest is favored more to have some excessive heat across that portion. But really across the entire state, it's going to be above normal. This is going to be more above normal down to the south and southwest, unfortunately. So I will then turn it over to Jim Fahey with the USDA and NRCS for the water outlook supply. Yep, 
Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. This is Jim uh, Fahey from uh, Casper, Wyoming, NRCS hydrologist. Um, this map's kind of busy. Let's, exp let's, let's go over it a little bit. I'm trying to uh, show you three things in one map. Uh, the bright uh, red color is the expected uh, uh, volume forecast for uh, those points you see on the map. And then the color of the, of the uh, rivers or the percent of average expecting for the, the rest of the runoff period or the main runoff period through July. And then the, uh, the proportional symbols you see, uh, you the green, yellow, and, and kind of orange there are looking to see how much we've, how much of the flow we've already gone through uh, of the forecast through July. As you can see, uh, that point there with that warm up we had a little bit in May and then the extreme warm up we had in early June where a lot of places are greater than 75% uh, of the, the expected uh, flow forecast for the year. Ex well, the main forecast through July. Exception as uh, up in the Northwest corner, the uh, Yellowstone River um, uh, near Fishing Bridge there, uh, still below 50% uh, of uh, flows. And that's pretty, that's pretty typical. They, the water usually doesn't come, come off pretty good, uh, pretty easy and it doesn't really peak until, oh, middle of uh, July. Um, uh, the bullets to look at on the left side, uh, just the main points, uh, we are at 55 to 65 percent of average stream flows statewide, and this is through the end of July. Uh, lowest volumes are less than 50 percent uh, along the Bear, Powder, North Platte, and Little Snake basins. Um, again, most of our area is 75 percent of the April through July flows. Uh, the points that I did look at, I tried to uh, try to look at each each basin um, with the data available. Um, also of note, um, just looking at specific points and volumetrics, um, for instance, the North Platte it's, uh, River, the Seminole Reservoir inflow, uh, if it everything holds true without any changes and drastically any any uh, precip uh, or climatology in the next couple of months. It'll be the fourth lowest uh, stream flow volume uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, Powder River at flowing in uh, to Wyoming, Montana border. This will be the third lowest uh, stream flow. The lowest were 2002 and 2004 were lower. And it was, if it's projected to be lower than 2012. And we're at about 44% of average stream flows for that, for the Powder River. Little Snake River and Bear River projected to uh, be the lowest uh, April, through, April through July stream flow volumes in the last 20 years. And one thing uh, it kind of stuck out was the uh, Snake River uh, at Flag Ranch, the Jackson Lake inflow. This, if this holds out that uh, 241,000 uh, uh, acre feet flow uh, through July will be the lowest since 1987 when we had, uh, I think it was 238,000 uh, acre feet. Uh, and that kind of shows up for the peak flows too. Uh, we had peak flow of 3260 CFS. And that again was lowest uh, since 1987 when we had 200, uh, 2900 CFS. So that one that, since I've been here 17, 18 years, uh, you could really rely on the Snake River uh, or a uh, exceptional flows are usually above average flows, but uh, this year is a little different um, for uh, the snake. So um, that's it for, that's all I have is one slide, a lot of stuff going on on one slide, but I hope you uh, can understand what I was trying to uh, tell you. It's a lot of brown as usual uh, for this, as all the other slides we saw already. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Our next speaker is Casey Cheesebro with the BLM to talk about green up and fuel status. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Tony mentioned, my name is Casey Cheesebro and the prescribed fire and fuel specialist for the Casper Field Office for the BLM here in Wyoming. And uh, yeah, I'll just do a quick rundown on uh, this energy release component, kind of what that is, um, just kind of a fuel moisture 101, if you will, for just a minute or two. Um, so when we're looking at fuel status, obviously we need to look at the live fuels and the dead fuels um, that, that can contribute to fire spread. So when you're looking at live fuels, obviously those are getting their, their moisture from the ground right through their root systems, which 
uh, as we saw with the drought that's ongoing, obviously that's been in short supply here this year so far. And then you've got the dead fuel, um, which we usually break out by size class anywhere from your grass, which we would call a one hour fuel, meaning it can uh, basically dries out in one hour, two thirds of that fuel particle will be, uh, will match the atmospheric humidity within one hour, uh, all the way up to our, what we call a thousand hour fuel being those larger uh, logs, anything above that three inches in diameter. So um, in between those two, we've got 10 hour fuels, anything from a quarter inch to one inch, and the 100 hour fuels one to three inches. So obviously those are gonna, those larger fuels are gonna dry more slowly. But uh, with the key thing with dead fuels, the only way that they're gonna absorb moisture or increase their fuel moisture is uh, through the atmosphere, right? And so we've seen the hot, dry weather that uh, the others have talked about so far. Um, you combine all those together, those different values, those thousand hour fuel moistures, live fuel moistures. Um, one way that we do that is with this energy release component, the ERC value, which basically is the uh, potential energy that could be released per unit area within the flaming zone of a fire. And so with that, we really want to focus on the percentiles. Uh, Tony did a great job explaining that earlier what the percentile means. Because um, obviously your lighter fuels, your grass areas, your grasses and shrubs are going to have uh, less energy to release than your timber fuels, right? So sites individually and then at those historical percentiles to really see where we're at. And uh, when you look at that right now, pretty, pretty similar. We don't have the browns, but the purple is, uh, is a bad thing here. So uh, 97th percentile and above is what those purple dots are. Those are our uh, remote uh, remote weather stations that are out there and that's what they're modeling right now for the ERC in those areas. So, you know, within that, there's obviously a 98th and 99th percentile and looking at a few of those sites specifically, um, especially down here, Southern Wyoming and through Central Wyoming and up into uh, Northeastern Wyoming, those are, are really right at that 99th percentile. So even, even 97th percentile probably sells them a little bit short, but, uh, Obviously some very, very dry fuels out there right now, um, really attributed to everything that everyone else has talked about. The, that percentiles base that says over here on the, the right there, that's based on the fire season, which is kind of loosely defined as May 1st through uh, late September through the end of September. So when we talk about percentile, that's uh, where those values are at compared to that uh, same, same time frame, May through September. The, uh, the plus signs in between there indicate that those sites are reporting uh, ERCs that are the highest that we've had in the last 15 years for this day, um, for June, I guess this is from yesterday, so June 16th. Uh, those stations are all setting maximum ERC values for the last 15 years. So you, know, you think back to the 2006, 2012 fire seasons and, and where we were at, those are, are pretty telling that we're, we're well above those, uh, those values right now. With the, the hot, dry weather, one thing we haven't seen a lot of is that really those sustained winds, you know, for multiple days. So the fires that we have had, uh, we've been a little bit aided by the fact that, that they haven't had a lot of wind on them for, for multiple days in a row. You know, Anthony will talk a little bit more about that. But uh, And then looking at green up, I know that was something else folks were, were wondering about. Uh, just took a kind of a cruise around these weather stations around the state, looking at, at where things are at and really what it looks like pretty much any of that low to mid elevation up into the kind of mid elevations in the foothills of, of all the major mountain ranges really in Wyoming uh, have already hit that peak green up and are starting to cure. Um, and then everything kind of as you go up a little higher into the mountains, we're still approaching that peak green up. And that's been been helpful, I know, on some of the fires so far that you know, they have have ran hard until they hit out into that green grass or in some of those meadows, um, but we'll won't be too long before we lose lose that favorable effect as well. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty dire situation right now, fuels wise. You know, the other thing I'll point out, I, I did include a little bit of Colorado in the map there, so you'll see basically they're in the same situation in northern Colorado, and that's. If I were to be able to drag that image uh, to the south a little bit, you'd see the same thing all the way down through southern Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and we're starting to see the same thing in Montana. So it's, you know, what does that mean? 
going a little bit more into the fire operations side, it, it probably means that we'll see a little bit of a shortage of resources here sooner than later for firefighting resources on uh, getting out of the fuels realm. But uh, when you start to see it that widespread, that's that's one of the challenges we run into. So, uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity to present. That's what I've got. Thanks, Casey. Next up is Anthony Schultz with the Wyoming State Forestry Division to look at the wildfire outlook. All right, can everybody hear me? Awesome, very good. I apologize for the poor audio. I'm uh, on the side of the highway at the moment. I am pulled over, so uh, we're, we're operating safely. Um, so uh, kind of as Casey said, uh, we're seeing, we're at fire activity levels we normally don't see until I want to say late July, August. So we're running, uh, I'm going to say a month uh, to two months ahead of schedule uh, just from pure fire occurrence uh, numbers. Right now, uh, year to date, uh, Casper Dispatch Center, which covers about three quarters of the state of Wyoming from southwest, wrapping up through the center around to the northeast. Uh, we're already at uh, roughly 80 wildfires that that dispatch center has helped uh, dispatch uh, resources to. That does not count all of the local municipality fires that say local volunteer fire departments are running on a daily basis necessarily. Additionally, uh, Great Plains Dispatch Center year to date is reporting uh, roughly 100 wildfires uh, within their area responsibility. They spill over into Wyoming and Crook and Weston counties. Um, unfortunately, I feel a little bit vindicated. I know I was on last time uh, and said, well, the maps aren't showing that the Northeast Wyoming is going to have a terrible fire season, uh, but it, we're there. Um, I was worried uh, just due to some of the activity levels that we were seeing already. Um, and to date, we've had several state fire fund, uh, requests for funding in that neck of the woods. And as recently as last night, we almost asked for a disaster declaration from FEMA uh, on the Pine Haven fire just uh, on Keyhole uh, Reservoir there. So uh, we had 200 homes threatened. Uh, luckily, I think we've only lost one uh, with that fire projected to be contained uh, later today. So statewide, uh, we're mirroring a lot of that activity. As Casey mentioned, um, there's very, there's not a whole lot of uh, parts of Wyoming that haven't experienced some sort of wildfire at this point in time. And that spans from any land ownership from national forest to BLM, state and private. Um, we've had the middle fork, or sorry, excuse me, the north fork down on the Medbow uh, in Casey's neck of the woods, all the way up to the one I'm headed to right now, um, kind of on the northern tier of Wyoming, the Robinson fire. Um, with that, uh, our Robinson fire, uh, we've had a type two uh, incident management team in state already. So geographically, um, our five state area to include South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming, and Colorado. Uh, we maintain three geographic incident management teams. And so when an incident reaches a certain complexity level, we go ahead and request their assistance. Um, the last time we had a type two team uh, in state this early to my recollection would be 2018 on the Medbow uh, with Badger. Uh, yeah, the Badger, the Badger fire. Um, and that also ended up being a FEMA uh, disaster fire. And so uh, when folks are throwing around um, terms like 2012, um, the fire folks get real scared because that's a busy year for us. Um, and so uh, we've got fire actively burning in all of those fuel types that everyone's been talking about. Um, the only thing that has truly saved us is the grass is green. Um, <laughs> and so when we get uh, fire come out of the, the heavy fuels uh, and into that one hour fuel component, um, we're getting aided uh, from Mother Nature at, the, at this point in time, but it really does scare me looking out into uh, July and August when we no longer have that type of assistance. And so uh, one not need look much further than Wyoming to understand we're kind of in the bullseye here. Uh, Montana is also experiencing a fairly severe early wild and fire season with uh, them already threatening to send several fires into Wyoming. Uh, both of those are uh, FEMA disaster fires. Um, they've been declared. Uh, and basically the, the threshold for that, I, I keep saying the uh, FEMA declaration, that, that what that means is there's generally 100 primary residences under evacuation um, at any given time. And so uh, FEMA assists states with funding of large fires um, when we hit that uh, sort of threshold. So um, Tony, you can go to the next slide. 
So what does that mean looking out? If you guys remember uh, last month, or yeah, I think it was last month, um, the same presentation here, uh, these maps looked a, a little different. Um, and so in July here, you kind of see that same bullseye in the southwestern portion of Wyoming there. Um, however, the, the interesting uh, piece to note here is in August. Um, in August, we, uh, the National Predictive Services Center was saying that uh, roughly, you know, the western uh, portion of Wyoming was really going to be the one at an elevated uh, risk for above uh, normal significant fire potential. Well, uh, pretty much the whole state is at this point. Um, that's not good. <laughs> and so uh, the, the thing that this map doesn't tell you is that we still need starts. Um, and so even though the state is going to be painted in this red bullseye for above significant wildfire potential, um, we still need that source of ignition, right? And so last year in Wyoming, roughly 85% of all fires were human caused. Uh, that's across the entire state. And so uh, if one were a betting man or a lady, you would wager that we're going to have uh, quite a few human starts that get beyond our local capacity. Uh, Casey touched on this briefly, but uh, what's really concerning and a little disturbing uh, with some of these new predictions and outlooks for the uh, significant wildfire potential here in Wyoming is that um, it's not just concerning from an occurrence perspective or necessarily how large those fires might get. Those are both concerning pieces, but uh, it is concerning from a resource availability perspective. Uh, when you see uh, states like Montana, Idaho, uh, particularly California, uh, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado's uh, sure to be burning at that same time frame, uh, resources become very thin. Uh, we've got roughly um, and this is painting with a broad brush, 30,000 fire folks that do wildland in the, uh, in the country. If you think of some of the larger fires in California, uh, we can suck anywhere of between 5,000, uh, 5, 8,000 folks on a single fire. Um, and so things become incredibly thin and we start getting uh, denied requests from dispatch, things like airplanes, things like hotshot crews, um, all that stuff you typically associate with being able to fight wildfire kind of evaporates. Um, and here in Wyoming, we don't necessarily have uh, the population base, say is a state like Colorado, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, or even Montana might have to justify gaining those resources uh, when you're comparing fires side by side. So um, it's, it's a disturbing trend we're headed towards and hopefully it's not at 2012 um, here in uh, 2021. So uh, with that uh, end of report, unless folks have questions. Thanks Anthony. Next up, we'll have Wendy Kelly with UW Extension and also the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub to talk, us, talk to us about how we can get involved. All right, thank you, Tony. So um, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Thank you. So I just wanted to uh, start out with the US Drought Monitor map that Tony presented at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, this is the one that was rolled out today. Again, there were some improvements since our last webinar, um, but also degradations. But the, the main message here is that greater than 92% of the state is classified between abnormally dry to extreme drought. Go ahead and advance the next slide. So there is a role for everybody on the presentation as well as for you to share this information with your stakeholders. And I know several of you have because I get your newsletters, so thank you. Um, as of uh, June 17th this morning, you can see on the left-hand side of the slide are the reports in COCORAS, which is a citizen science um, program that you can sign up to, to report precipitation or lack of at your home or your office. So you use a standard rain gauge that is sort of certified by COCORAS and set it out and report it. So this morning you can see there was a lot of uh, zero precipitation throughout the state with a little bit maybe down in Albany County. To the right is just showing active stations that are registered here in the state of Wyoming. So there's a lot of white area. And as we all know, there's variability in precipitation. You can be driving, it's raining on your windshield, two seconds later it's not, and then it starts raining again. So the more we can fill in these gaps, it really helps us to know what the precipitation looks like out on the ground and, and where the gaps are. So I encourage you to share this information uh, with your stakeholders. You could even have a rain gauge at your office. 
Tony is the administrator of this program here in Wyoming. So you can reach out to Tony or myself and we can get you the information to sign up or to pass on to your stakeholders. Next slide. I also want to share about the Condition Monitoring Observer Report System. This is the national database where you can submit reports um, regarding conditions and impacts in your area. And the one I'm highlighting here is reported from, uh, was reported on June 10th. And off to the right, you can see a blue dot. And that blue dot indicates that it's moderately, moderately wet. Uh, but if you read the report, it actually, uh, it, it's very, it's more dry there. So it's moderately dry. And I put in the blue box that the moisture received early spring from snows has soaked in very deep, leaving the upper topsoil layers dry. I wanted to highlight this report. Um, just one to let you know that we do read these reports. We're looking at them at a weekly basis and not only ourselves here in the state, but also um, individuals at the that write the, the um, USDM map. And so encourage, I encourage each of you as well as your stakeholders to submit reports into the, the Seymour system. And you can see at the top that there's different um, categories, everything from crops and livestock, as well as surface water, household, etc. So it, it, it spans the gamut. And Tony had just highlighted the bit.ly link of where you can submit those reports. Uh, next slide, please. I did want to highlight one other report that came in on June 16th here in Sublet County, where I'm located. Um, something I really appreciated about this report on the left hand side of the screen, you can see that they got specific about how localized or widespread the conditions are talking about the middle piney drainage um, and then saying, you know, it, it appears that it has expanded beyond that area as well. And that's always really helpful for us when um, I'm located in Sublette County, but when I'm not located in an area uh, to be able to go in and get more familiar with that report in the area it's describing. Over on the right in the blue box, they provided a really nice example of some photos that uh, they included. So this reporter included two images. And so they're explaining that typically it looks like a nice meadow, um, you know, one to two inch nap length this year, et cetera. And I, I included one of the pictures that they uploaded, you can see here. Uh, Tony, go ahead and go to the next slide. I wanted to share that last report in part because they mentioned really specific on the drainage, which was helpful, but also the photos. Um, you know, photos do um, speak a thousand words or are worth a thousand words. The one drawback of that report was I'm, I'm not personally familiar with that area. And so to add more value, I ask all of you as well as your stakeholders to, if possible, submit compar comparison photos. So showing what that pasture looks like, um, you know, in, in a good year versus this year around the same time of year. So around June 16th or June 17th. Um, that, that speaks volumes uh, to be able to see that comparison. I also encourage everybody to submit reports monthly if possible. Say, mark your calendar for June 1st or the 15th um, of every month and submit a report so that we can kind of have a trend or see what it looks like out on the ground as it evolves. And the last thing I want to share on this slide is that the um, Seymour is not always compatible with all web browsers from what I've heard. So if it's not working in a specific web browser, you might consider trying an alternative one. Next slide. Uh, the last slide here that I have for you is a, a link to the Seymour fact sheet. Um, so you'll see on the left hand side of the screen, there's a bit.ly link. That's where you can find a fact sheet with more information about the Seymour reporting system, which again is the national database that you can submit conditions and impacts into. Uh, there's also a field app now as well, and there's directions on how to submit reports from your mobile device. And I wanted to highlight that here. So with that, I want to thank all of the presenters today for, for joining us. This is truly a collaborative effort with uh, a number of different agencies. 
and their logos are listed at the top of this slide. I'll also note that all of the names of the presenters as well as their email addresses are on this slide. And last, I wanna highlight in the lower right hand side, the um, Wyoming Drought Information and Resources website. Some of you joined after we started today. This is a new website that the governor rolled out last week. And as Tony noted at the beginning of the presentation, um, we want this to be a hub for all of you as well as your stakeholders to go to, to be able to get more information and resources related to drought here in Wyoming. That being said, it's a two-way communication. So if you're aware of um, designations or assistance programs, uh, calls on water, et cetera, if you would let uh, Tony and I know, and we'll continue to keep this website as up to date as possible. I also wanna highlight again, Coco Ross and the Seymour system and those websites so that you can access those, access those um, and help us to document the conditions out on the ground. So with that, I thank you for your time. And again, thank you to all the presenters and I will stop recording. <laughs>